Our first lesson this morning comes from the Hebrew Scriptures, the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. After the great flood, God promises to be with Noah and his descendants forever. Hear these words from the New Living Translation of the Bible. Then God told Noah and his sons, I hereby confirm my covenant with you and your descendants and with all the animals that were on the boat with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, every living creature on earth. Yes, I am confirming my covenant with you. Never again will floodwaters kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. Then God said, I am giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all living creatures for all generations to come. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. When I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds, and I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the floodwaters destroy all life. When I see rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. Then God said to Noah, Yes, this rainbow is the sign of the covenant I am confirming with all the creatures on earth. Our second lesson also comes from the Hebrew scriptures, the book of Psalms, Psalm 25, verses 1 to 10. The psalmist expresses in prayer the desire to take refuge in the Lord and to walk in God's ways. Hear these words from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition of the Bible. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Our final lesson this morning comes from the Christian scriptures, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. Immediately after his baptism, Jesus is driven into the wilderness where there are wild animals with him. Hear these words from Eugene Peterson's The Message. At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. The moment he came out of the water, he saw the sky split open and God's spirit, looking like a dove, come down on him. Along with the spirit, a voice, you are my son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. At once, this same spirit pushed Jesus out into the wild for 40 wilderness days and nights, he was tested by Satan. Wild animals were his companions, and angels took care of him. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee, preaching the message of God. Time's up. God's kingdom is here. Change your life and believe the message. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Let us pray. O oh God, come to us in the quietness of this very moment. Center our hearts and our minds on you and you alone. Open us to the power and to the presence of your Holy Spirit and remind us of your love, grace, and mercy that it comes to us unasked for and free. Amen. So the word routine is defined as the usual series of things that one does at a particular time. 
In the church's liturgical calendar, we have seasons of time in which we routinely celebrate. For example, Advent, Christmas, Epiphany. Well, today is the first Sunday in Lent. And while we routinely observe this as a season, as the 40 days, not counting Sundays, before Easter, the date that Easter is observed differs from year to year, thanks to the Council of Nicaea, who in 325 CE established a uniformed method for determining the date of Easter. So, since the fourth century, Easter has been observed on the first Sunday after the full moon that occurs on or after the spring equinox. That was easy, right? That's easy to remember. Let's see, the first Sunday after the full moon that occurs on or after the spring equinox. Oh, okay, I got that. Well, we're early this year. Although it doesn't look like winter's going to agree with us, but at least we know that Easter is early this year. So I've been thinking this past week about the tradition or the routine of Lent that we observe every year. Lent is the time of intentional reconnection with God, described as a period of self-examination and prayer, repentance, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word. Rachel Mann puts it this way, the season of Lent is a gift. It presents an annual opportunity to reassess where we are in our relationship with God and the world, with self and others. Our Lenten conversations on spiritual practices, which we will be holding at 10 o'clock each Wednesday during Lent, is intended to aid us in our Lenten routines. This morning's gospel reading from Luke, excuse me, from Mark, sets the stage for this observance of Lent. Following Jesus' baptism and the Spirit descending like a dove on him, Eugene Peterson writes, At once this, this same Spirit pushed Jesus into the wild. For forty wilderness days and nights he was tested by Satan. Wild animals were his companions and angels took care of him. This past Wednesday during our Ash Wednesday service, I said that the practice of fasting is quite old. What is fasting? Well, to fast is to abstain from something, usually food or drink, for a period. For centuries, all religions have fasted for spiritual reasons, and Christians have developed ways of fasting, and there are certain days and seasons in which it is appropriate period of time in which we fast. But you know, I've been thinking, rather than thinking about Lent as this period in which we give up things, perhaps we can think of it this way. Emptying ourselves just a little bit to create space for God to remind us of our dependence on God. So emptying ourselves. On Wednesday I suggested that the main purpose of fasting involves the question, what do we desire to be filled with? So rather than focusing solely on fasting as giving something up, we might think about the positives that we might add during this season of Lent. And then on Wednesday, I, I read this list that I had seen on social media recently, words of Pope Francis about fasting. And the Pope encourages the faithful to, quote, 
fast from hurting words and say kind words. Fast from anger and be filled with patience. Fast from bitterness and be filled, fill your hearts with joy. Fast from worries and have trust in God. Now, there were uh, a total of 11 statements that the Pope had said about fasting, and, and you'll find those posted on the door to my office if you want to read the whole list. We are beginning our journey through Lent, and like any well-prepared traveler, we make our plans for these six weeks ahead of us. Lent is about leaving our past behind and, and braving an unknown future, carrying with us nothing but the mark of God's love. So the story of Noah in this morning's Hebrew scripture seems rather odd to be paired with the usual or the routine gospel message or passage about Jesus fasting in the wilderness. This lesson is kind of shocking and frightening if you think about it. I mean, there's death and destruction. And as much as we want to fast forward through that challenging part and focus on the end, we can't overlook the beginning, the deadly earth-covering waters. You know, it is a, a sad, horrifying story. But Will Willimon says that the account of Noah is an appropriate story to read at the beginning of the season of Lent. He writes these 40 this 40-day time of honesty is a season when we confront our sin and confess our guilt. We have lived in such a way as to make our creator regret having, having given us life. Yeah, ouch. I know those of us in the mainline Protestant church kind of squirm in our seats whenever there is a discussion about sin, the image of judgment and hell and damnation come to mind. So we just, just as soon skip over the difficult passages in scripture that make us uncomfortable, right? Why must we read this sordid story about our corrupt, misbehaving descendants? We didn't know them. There's this implication that we too are just as wicked as our ancestors. But Wilmon writes, why do we do this? Because the church is not only about reconciliation, love, and comfort. The church is also about truth. And this ancient story tells the truth about how we got to where we are today. We have been wrong from the first, from the very first. Read this morning's newspaper, check out a book on the history of our age, and there is so much death, so much chaotic destruction, not by water, not through punishment by God, but by our own wickedness. So our routine in Lent is this annual invitation to look deep within inside ourselves, seeing ways in which we perhaps have hurt another, realizing that we have not been living as God intends. Lent is this time in which we can recommit ourselves to change, to contemplate those things that we will never do or say again. Look at it as an opportunity for a new beginning, 
as we prepare ourselves for the arrival of our risen Christ on Easter. Lent reminds us that we are still beloved by God. Just as we are, just as God has created us. So that is a that is good news and a welcome on this annual routine of ours. And so on this first Sunday in Lent, the rainbow is a symbol to remind us that sin will not be the last word, but rather the last word will be God's awesome love. Humanity is forgiven, and the rainbow is a sign of God's promise that the flood waters will never again cover the earth. Today's text, never again will the flood waters destroy all life. When I see a rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. Now, Lent is different than Epiphany, so we are shifting from Epiphany to Lent. Lent, our readings seems kind of odd because it begins on a somber note. The story of Jesus in the wilderness, 40 days being tempted by Satan, that sets the tone for the six-week journey that we have begun together. Now, this routine, this annual reading of the temptation is from Mark. It's not as detailed as Matthew's version of these events, which we looked at last year. But we know the story well, because we routinely hear it every first Sunday in Lent. But we remember it again in our routine as we contemplate our wanderings in the wilderness over these next six weeks. As we ponder what it is that we must let go of in Lent and what it is that we should add to our routines, let us not lose track of what the story is about that we read each year and what God is doing out there in the wilderness. See, this is an opportunity for us to, to deepen our understanding of who Jesus is. And although we are told quite clearly on the first Sunday of Epiphany, having read this exact same passage from the Gospel of Mark just last month, the voice from heaven at Jesus' baptism clearly tells us that he is the Son of God. So today's lesson is more about the, the way and the why as Jesus goes about his ministry. We might say that God is setting some ground rules. You see, the Son of God is not here to grab power or to show off how much he matters to God or to do some sort of magic for the masses. No. You see, Jesus will leave the wilderness filled with the Holy Spirit with the assurance that he is God's beloved and that he is ready and prepared for what lies ahead. And so we trust God's presence with us on our holy wanderings in our wilderness during these 40 days of Lent. The psalmist writes, in you I trust. Speaking of God, in you I trust. As you know, in financial planning, a perpetual trust is a, a type of trust that is used to pass down property from generation 
to generation. The rainbow is a sign of God's promise, a perpetual trust. One commentator writes, the rainbow is not intended to be a covenant reminder for us. It is a sign for God. When the bow is in the cloud's eye, God will see it and remember. God says this twice in different ways in the story. God is the initiator of the covenant and God provides a self-reminder. So no matter what the circumstances, God never forgets God's promises. God can't. The rainbow in the sky is a reminder of God's promise to us. Perhaps that is the most important lesson from Mark's text this morning. God won't forget. Neither should we. So as we go through yet our routine of yet another Lenten season, may we be reminded of God's covenantal promise then and God's new covenant proclaimed from the waters of the Jordan. The text writing... Jesus went to Galilee preaching the message of God. As Eugene Peterson writes, time's up. God's kingdom is here. Change your life and believe in the message. So as our Lenten journey begins, may those wilderness beasts of ours be kept at bay and that our companion in our wilderness be none other than the one we follow as we place our perpetual trust in him. Amen.